Next up is um, my good friend, Dr. Barbara Nesbitt. Super excited to hear from her today. So I'm going to have you take the screen and share with Absolutely. us what's going on for you and and uh, anything else you want to talk about. I mean, yeah. Well, first off, thank you so much, um, Leilani. It's always a pleasure to attend your events, and it's even um, a greater honor to be able to um, share some of our story with um, colleagues around the um, around the country. So, thank you. Um, you know, it's really hard. Um, I, I have to admit, I was given kind of a broad topic to, uh, of which I could choose to share. So, I, I chose a little different track than my friends in North Carolina. So, I'm glad. Um, because maybe we'll piggyback together. Um, and they focused on really kind of their short pandemic window. And I, I want to share with you all a little bit about how we have tried to remove barriers um, to equity, access, and opportunity. And then I put kind of in a pandemic in a little bit of a different color because this was a presentation that um, Sharon Huff, my assistant superintendent for instructional services, and I had put together to share the National School Boards Association back in April. And then that obviously got canceled because of COVID. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about how it, it, that I think what we had been working on for years helped us in a pandemic and what, where we still have to where we still have barriers to overcome. So a little bit about our story. Forgive me for going fast, but 20, 30 minutes is not very long. Um, but we have. 14 elementary schools, 15 middle schools, four high schools, a career center, 16,000 students. So for some parts of the country, we're a fairly large school district. We consider ourselves a really a mid-sized school district. Our claim to fame in this area um, is that Clemson University is in our hometown. So Clemson is one of our attendance areas um, at the Daniel High School. So if that helps you all know a little bit more about where we are. And then I, I've actually have given a, um, a presentation at a learning council event before about going from political gridlock to instructional innovation. And I'm not going to say a lot about it, except to say um, that everything that you hear me talk about as we look at how we've been able to grow over the last six years, be fairly prepared for the pandemic and looking ahead to the future, came out of some really challenging times politically. So if you're in that position, um, feel free to reach out to me and I'll have my superintendent get with yours and maybe share some strategies for moving beyond political gridlock. Um, but right now we have a highly functioning school board um, who's established really four pillars and priorities are like childhood innovation, college and career readiness and authentic ways with career technology education as well. And under, under uh, all of that is this character and citizenship. And I wanna tell you a little bit about some major partnerships that we have in our, um, our district that I think maybe speak, speak a little bit to um, our district. We are a member of the Innovation and Transformational Leadership Network um, with um, Bill Daggett and have received an award. So we have been working toward innovation and transformational leadership and personalized learning for a number of years. We are really enmeshed with IMS Global and the interoperable standards. And you're gonna see that in some of the stuff we present about our digital ecosystem. Um, and, and really making sure that everything is works together as seamlessly as possible with as least amount of clicks and memorizing, memorization of URLs and passwords and all of that. And um, also this last one here, the teacher training school with the University of Ulu, our superintendent had an opportunity to participate with um, a group of educators that traveled to Finland several years ago. And we have an ongoing relationship with them now where we send people to um, Finland every year and they actually send people over here to us and we really learn from each other. And I would say that one of the things we have learned the most from, from our partnership with the University of Ulu is the importance of social emotional well-being in children. And so in our district, we have Finnish Fridays where this is their model all the time. And we do this on Fridays where you have 45 minutes of instruction and 15 minutes of recess. And we do this throughout the district and our kids love it. Um, it's our lowest um, day where we've missed attendance. Um, so we have really tried to focus on children's playing and being outside and that it's not all about learning and that sometimes you're better off having 45 really good minutes of learning so that you can have 15 minutes of play. And it doesn't mean that we don't play on the other days, but we really have been trying to see if we think that that model can work in America. And believe it or not, our, our parents love it. We thought we might get hit up with how much time are they spending at recess? But these kids, they go out and they come back in in just 15 minutes. And it, it has just it has just changed, I think, how we approach the stress of schools. 
And it's one of the things that we've been concerned about with, you know, with not seeing all of our kids. So just to add, it's a little bit of background. And so um, my instructional colleague and I, um, Sharon Huff, along with a team of people got together to talk about how can we really market and communicate our vision for personalized learning. And my, my hat that I wear um, is the Assistant Superintendent for Technology Services. So uh, you're gonna see a little bit of in here about how technology supports instruction. Technology is just a tool, but I really don't know how you can personalize learning for children without technology. I think that technology is a great enabler when used effectively. And so this is what we came up with um, and we, we have down here, like we've done the Tomlinson's differentiated instruction, a lot of training in that. We've, we've defined a lot for our teachers about giving kids more um, choice and voice over their time, path, pace, and place of learning. But how we chose to kind of define it is um, empowered learners in, in, uh, involved in engaging learning opportunities in quality learning environments. So we have our, our who, our learners, their, their what, the opportunities and the where, the quality learning environments, and just how flexible can we be with these to support personalized learning. And so we believe that personalized learning is a way for us to provide equity for all. And so I'm going to go through these quickly, but hopefully um, Lalani will share these slides with you all afterwards and you can see like empowering learners in so many different ways, but mostly it's about giving our kids choices, not where we're choosing for them, but where they have opportunities to choose for themselves. And what it looks like for a five-year-old to choose and a, and a 12th grader to choose are very different. So we're not talking about a five-year-old coming in and being able to choose, you know, well, I really don't want to work on that today. Um, you know, so we're talking about growing them up so that by the time they leave us the 12th grade and they enter college or career, they feel empowered to make decisions for their lives. And so that's our goal is to empower them. And there's many, many ways that we try to do that and things we have purposely put in place with social emotional learning, interest inventories, choices where we've trained teachers and we've worked to help them um, see that their kids have growth mindsets. And we try to do Everything that we're doing with kids, we try to model first with teachers so that we are empowering our teachers um, because empowered learners have empowered teachers. And so we want to know that we want our teachers to know that we trust them. Quality learning environments can be the brick and mortar. It can be virtual, can be um, 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 dual enrollment. It can be flexible seating. We have all kinds of different virtual programming, early childhood expansion maker spaces in our classrooms, as well as a host of year round opportunities for our kids so that we make sure, number one, they're successful in, in mastering the basics, but also have opportunity to grow further. And then the different opportunities we provide are work based learning, project based learning, um, you know, passion projects, we have, we do swimming here with our kids so that we live a lot of lakes here in the mountains, we want our kids to swim. So those are just a few. So I'm going to share a little bit about the tech barriers that we have overcome so far um, as a district that pre-COVID that I think helped us. And one is we've really worked hard on our digital ecosystem with instruction and technology. So we have a, a single sign-on platform, a, a learning management system, a learning object repository with Safari Montage. And we had just rolled out Cisco WebEx as a video conferencing tool. And all of these are just foundational tools and all of the apps that we have, we try to have um, where they, they're IMS compliant so that we have single sign-on, we roster for our teachers. Teachers can have choose, they can have their kids start from ClassLink and go to a web platform or they can go to Schoology and they can embed specific lessons. And then we wanna get data and analytics back for this. We were prior to COVID one-to-one -one in grades three through 12. So the other things that we had done is we had been working on virtual programs for five years and had expanded quite a bit and we're getting pretty close to wanting to offer a full-time virtual academy before COVID hit. Um, another thing that we had done is we had put in a Cisco WebEx room kit for at each high school and this ex shows an example here of students at one high school who are taking AP statistics and there are only three of the students here. And so we couldn't offer them AP statistics at this school, but through this WebEx room kit, they were able to participate live with the teacher where there were more students at um, about 15 miles away. 
And occasionally the teacher would come here and an assistant would be up at the other mountain school. And these students were able to share the same teacher for synchronous instruction with high quality technology where it felt like the kids were right there. And we were proud to say that 100% of our kids got a four or five on the AP statistics test. And we're, um, we're expanding this. So we did more this year. And we're going to see how we're expanding this even more. And another thing that greatly helped us be ready for the pandemic is we started one of um, a handful of districts that were asked to be involved with a digital learning day is what we call it, but an e-learning day for inclement weather. And so we had been doing this for two years when the pandemic hit. And so it was, I think in many ways, easy for us to take digital learning days into remote learning and what that looked like. On digital learning days, there's no synchronous instruction, but the kids know how to get to the digital resources and get access to the folder of work to do. Um, and then we have our own hashtag SDPC weatherproof and parents and kids post pictures. And it's kind of a fun social media day for us when we get to do it. We don't get a lot of snow here in South Carolina. Um, so when we do, we really want to take advantage of it. And that's why we don't do synchronous instruction because we want kids to have the flexibility to go out and play and then they can finish the work when they want to. But teachers do have office hours. So when we hit the pandemic, some of the things that we kind of were able to change and I felt we did fairly well is we were able to take our digital learning day and, and add a synchronous schedule to it where the kids joined with WebEx and they were able to have kind of an abbreviated schedule. So, I mean, we didn't want our kids sitting in front of WebEx all day, but we were able to give them some of that. And then they were able to do some other things either in groups um, where they could go into breakout rooms in WebEx or do some work on their own and then come back. We had just rolled out WebEx and how we like to roll things out, as I said before, is to use it with teachers. So they're students. And so we had used WebEx at a February professional learning day for purposefully planning to use it so that they could say, hey, this was a great experience as a student. Here's how I could use it as a teacher. And we had that had just started to happen. And then March 13th hit and our governor sh shut down our schools. So they had to learn WebEx fairly quickly, but they had had an opportunity to see it as a student. And I'll say our teachers rocked it. It really did well. We were able to pull all of our early childhood devices. We had one device for every three kids in early childhood, and we pulled them and were able to get them into second graders' hands. And unfortunately, our youngest kids had packets that they did, although they did have WebEx office hours where the, and the teachers connected with every child at least once a week where they could see them. If it wasn't through WebEx, it was a phone call or a home visit. And our assistant superintendent, Sharon, likes it, always said to the teachers then, love before lessons. So before you start a lesson, check in on them. How are they doing? All the morning meeting stuff you would do in the classroom, we, we, we had our, our teachers do. And I do think it helped. Um, my colleague in North Carolina hit it when he said that internet access was a huge barrier. We were able to, uh, with our board, we were able to get hotspots to a thousand families who did not have access. Um, and so, I mean, it not only impacts this internet access, act, um, their ability to respond in a pandemic, but just access to healthcare, remote work for parents, all, all kinds of things. Well, I show this picture because we had one, one family, and this is one story of hundreds that I could tell and you could tell as well, where we went to just to check on this child for a well check and the student was sitting in the back of a pickup truck on an air mattress that was blown up because that was the only place that her hotspot would work so she could do her homework and she was in fourth grade. And so I want you to think about the commitment it takes for a student to get into a truck and blow up their air mattress every day and to log in to Schoology and do their work through a hotspot on a Chromebook sitting in the back of a truck. And so that's what our kids were dealing with. Um, and we were able to kind of overcome that, but it was a really barely adequate Band-Aid because hotspots don't work great for video on Chromebooks. Um, and so we, we had external access points at all of our um, schools. We had, that project had been mostly finished prior to COVID. So we did have kids and community members come in and, and access the internet from any of our parking lots at our schools. And we, uh, we made our guest network open to the community. So if a parent needed to do anything, even if it was non-related to school, they could come access our internet um, and guest. I mean, it was filtered and locked down, but they were able to do it if they needed to do something, apply for a job or whatever. It was a, kind of a service. Like my colleagues in North Carolina, we had a feeding program and we did offer 
going from the summer into the fall at full-time Pickens County Virtual Academy. And while we could talk hours on that, it was a lot of work to pull off, but we did pull it off K through 12. And we had 33% of our students choose that option. The rest were allowed to come back full-time. So we were full-time face-to-face from the beginning of August with some remote learning days when um, a particular school grade level had high numbers of COVID. We also offered some honors and AP courses with synchronous live instruction, where we did not have courses that had been approved for virtual learning through the NCAA for kids who maybe were gonna be athletes and we wanted to make sure they were taken care of. So some barriers post COVID, I think we're gonna be able to handle. And one one is we're ongoing work with personalized learning. We've got a full-time virtual academy. We think that's gonna go on forever. We've actually hired a full-time staff and a director for that. Um, WebEx conferencing teachers are so routine now. They use it all the time. They, um, whereas before we, we would say, can we really do a WebEx with parents for a parent meeting if the parents can't come in? Yeah, we can. We don't even think about it twice. We, are, we think more flexibly now. And so whereas before, if you had a student who was out sick and they wanted to remote in, WebEx in, and participate in class, we were, we were like, well, do we mark them out for attendance? Like, do we let them do that? Because what if they get the test ahead of time? And we had all these kind of like worries that now we're just like, oh yeah, we can do that. And then we, we did receive, we found out this fall, we were recipients of a million dollar grant to expand the Cisco digital learning rooms across the county. And we're really excited about being able to offer more synchronous instruction and opportunities at middle school and high school for some rigorous um, courses. And we've been able to go tech at home for grades um, 5K in first grade. And we think this will ultimately help. But we do have several barriers that we have yet to overcome. And the biggest, I think, is just catching these kids up. Um, so even though we were full time from for the majority of our kids, we, we let them come make, make a choice again at second semester. We did not at the, at the middle of the first semester. We had um, most ki- a lot of kids came back, but still 20% chose to stay. And we had about 200 who were face-to-face who decided to do virtual. And so some of the things that we have some plans for are doing face-to-face this summer. So we're spending a lot of our, our money that we got um, as our money from the, in the second wave for camps and we want them face to face and we've got the embedded social social um, emotional learning support in it. The first one is Camp I Rock and we could probably do it. We've actually have done like two hour um, presentations on our Camp I Rock program, which is phenomenal in partnership with the YMCA and the United Way where all of our students in kindergarten, first, second and third grade who are the most struggling readers. So not all students, but all schools can send students who are struggling readers and they participate in a full eight week summer reading camp. In six weeks, they have half a day of instruction, actually four hours of reading instruction. We have um, college students who are in education are there helping read plus a counselor. And in the afternoon, they get a full experience with camp. Um, We provide transportation and food and um, we get that funded partially through the state and partially through the United Way and through a grant with the YMCA. We, we were able to do that last summer, but it's the only thing we were able to do last summer. And some of it was virtual and trying to do virtual camp with your weakest readers was so hard. And, but we're so excited to get that full time. And then we're gonna add our math camp, our arts camp for gifted and talented. We do camps for our rising sixth graders. We call them rise camps. And we've been doing this for a while and we're able to, to offer even more of this and longer camps this summer. STEM and robotics, a lot of these are things we've already done, but we are doing additional in-person summer school in K through 12th grade for kids who are showing academic needs. And we've got some a grant money to get book materials, reading materials into kids' hands, K through 12, what we're, we're really excited about. And we're also looking to write our own curriculum, but the, the concern for us is, and I don't know how it is for you all, but many of the parents who chose virtual learning in Pickens County were the ones that we, some of them were probably the least prepared to be able to support their kids with virtual learning. So we were concerned giving them that choice 
that it would be a struggle. And for some kids, it really has been. And so how do we, as we're looking at going into a full-time virtual academy, make sure that the kids who have the most support and are able to be successful are the ones that are in the virtual academy and the ones who really need to be face-to-face with us or face-to-face. And those are some issues we're struggling with. Um, Another big issue is um, broadband. And so I said we had really worked on hotspots, but they're such a poor solution. And so what we did last summer is um, I worked with our county council and we went together to pay um, this gentleman who's phenomenal, by the way, if you're interested, he he actually does this as, as um, for a living. And I'll get, get you his information, but Jim Str- Stritzinger, and he had actually had a grant with the state of South Carolina's healthcare to map broadband access in South Carolina through the speed test Orca, um, UCLA company. And so he has access to all of their data that's done from home, not on mobile devices, but on home broadband. And he gets that data and can geocode it. And I'm gonna show you some of his work, but we formed a group, um, included some area businesses, some rural co-ops, um, like water utility, electric and healthcare. And we came up with a plan. And so that plan is being executed. But what we did is, Jim Strissinger had mapped and black is where it's really good. So that's fiber. We're in this corner up here. Anything with blue, the lighter blue is good and anything orange and below is not good. And that means that, the, that there's not true broadband available. And then we put on top, then we have where do most of the people live who don't have access. And so we were able to go in and do that for Pickens County. And you can see we have very little fiber to homes in Pickens County. And it looks like a lot of it's blue. But the problem is, is that where a lot of people live, they don't have access to the Internet. So what we did is we took eight boxes as a, as a kind of broadband champion group. And we, we found out the eight, eight areas of our county we wanted to work on. And so Blue Ridge Electric Co-op. As, as an electrical co-op, has wanted to get into the into the internet service provider business and ran into a lot of political roadblocks in South Carolina until COVID. And so Leilani talks about some of the blessings that come from COVID. And I think that the light that has been shed on the um, broadband need, especially in rural America, ha- is a positive. And so the state actually changed some laws and they're allowing um, um utility companies to get into the ISP business. And so Blue Ridge is doing that. Now they did some trade-offs in South Carolina where Blue Ridge is, is in order to become an internet service provider, they have to give um, either reduced cost or free access to competitors to their poles, to their telephone poles. So um, we've, at, we've partnered with them as a school district. So we're trying to like write grants together with them, but our county council it gave going back to these six block eight blocks here two hundred thousand dollars to Blue Ridge um, if they will prioritize these eight blocks first so that we're going to address the needs of this community where we don't have broadband access first um, and so instead of them going off to the easy pickings they're going to easy areas in Pickens County they're going to do do the areas where we have the greatest need and they've been incentivized to do this and then we're looking at seeing how hopefully e rate rules are going to come up with another category, like category one and two now, a third category, where we can actually write and get some E-rate funds for partners like Blue Ridge to take out to our homes and our students internet, high-speed internet access. And so that's exciting for us. So I've gone very quickly, so I have a few minutes, but our story, and I, I put a tagline here just reminding you, empowered learners, engaging learning opportunities, and quality learning environments. And our tagline for this it's going to be my choices, my success, my SDPC, and we're going to try to tell the, the voices of students of how they've been successful through being empowered to choose. And so I want you to think for a minute about your choices, your story, and leave you with two questions. So how can your district and community leadership work together to remove barriers to equity, access, and opportunity? And are you thinking about this in terms of race, rurality, and poverty so all students become empowered learners so that it's not just, you're not just giving these opportunities to people who already live in areas where they have broadband, or you're not just giving these opportunities to parents who can afford to send their kids, to give their kids a car so they can drive to the career center, but you're thinking about how 
all of these opportunities for empowered learners and engaging learning opportunities in quality learning environments that all students are able to choose them and you're removing the barriers of access for these students. So I think I have a couple minutes, Lani, for, uh, for questions. Yeah, and you know, I'm Bernie with questions. I always am. So if no one else raises their hands or pipes up, you know, please pipe up people. First of all, we want to feel like we're together, like there's togetherness. We love that. Um, but we are going into a, a, another hour where, we're gonna, where I'm going to pelt people with questions. We're waiting for Dr. Sean Johnson, Superintendent of Clarendon, uh, too, to join us as well, uh, Barbara. But I know you're staying on. I I'll tell you, this is some advanced thinking. You your district is, I think, one of the only ones in the country that I've talked to so far with some 20,000 executives that have been on the line with us since March <clears throat> that really it has said, you're not just thinking within the confines of your, of your land mass. You're, you're looking across the entire physical geography of what your district covers. Like that's unique. I, and I'm, I'm very proud of you for doing that because that's the real heart of equity. I mean, come on. Like, I mean, we, we, right. we, you know, people have to be provided access. This isn't, this is no joke. I mean, we, you know, even that's right. Child left out in the dark somewhere where they're in the back of a truck is ridiculous. It, it is. And if we're, if we're looking at changing time, path, pace and place for students where they have access to these amazing opportunities, if you have a student of poverty who has an opportunity to work and they can get a ride to work on, on A day or B, A day or B day. We, we don't want the, the fact that they also are taking a virtual school and that's the only time they have access. They have to take the bus in order to do their coursework. We don't want that to conflict with their opportunity to get work-based learning opportunities through work experience. Like we want our kids to be able to choose. And we have found that one of the greatest barriers is high-speed internet access. And so we've addressed it. And in fact, several years ago, our district applied for E-rate money for E-rate modernization category one funds. And we have this huge fiber network now, high-speed fiber network. And what's really cool, Leilani, is that Blue Ridge Electric Co-op is going to lease the fiber network, the same fiber network that we're leasing. And I know I'm getting really technical here, but if you're techie online, you can follow up with me later if you're interested. And Blue Ridge and Conterra, Conterra is one, our, they're, they're pro our provider. Um, they are going to lease Conterra's network, the middle portion. So, and that's the mid, mid mile. So they can get the last mile done because we've already built the middle mile. And that was actually the intent of E-Rate modernization was to put fiber in the ground for schools so that we could get fiber to the home. And I think we're going to be one of the first school districts that actually gets it done first. And what's exciting is that Blue Ridge has agreed to peer with us so that if you're a student at home, you can access our networks with fewer hops on commodity. Blue Ridge can offload any student traffic on our Chromebooks to peered networks with us. We're also peering with Clemson University C-Lite for Internet 2 access so that kids at home will be able to access um, through virtual desktop imaging, whatever is needed, both C-Lite Internet 2 and us through peering with a local internet service provider, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's super cool. Well, I have a bunch to ask you about student agency as we come back into the next hour. So I'm going to go back on video and, and start having a, a broader discussion with Dr. Nesbitt. And there we go. All right. And I need to share my screen as well. And there's so much to talk about, but I want to talk about first... I think we're waiting for um, Dr. Sean Johnson to join us uh, and hopefully he does and he'll give us a little brief intro when he gets on, like what's happening there. We've been good friends with Tanya Smith there at Clarendon since I think the very first year Learning Council was in operation. So excited to hear from them. Um, but Barbara, here's the thing about your district that is so super groovy cool. <clears throat> You've been driving at students having their own agency for many years. Mm -hmm. And if I can pick out one, and I know you're super sophisticated with integrations and IMS Global and all that other stuff, but I have to say, when the pandemic came in, students who had the will already indoctrinated in them to, to drive themselves is the number one differentiator. Mm -hmm. So many superintendents now have said to us, it's like, 
engagement. Like they're not getting online. Nationally, the statistic is 35% of kids are not showing up. Um, holy cow. How are you supposed to drive learning when you have that percentage? Like this is ridiculous. So, so talk to me about what your advice would be to those leaders out there who didn't start off on that sort of baseline and kids are being used to being run around. Like they don't even get permission to go to the bathroom without checking in right now. They got to run themselves. What would you say? Wow. That's a, that's a big question. You know, back in the spring, when all this happened, we had 11 kids out of 16,000 that did not engage, didn't even get online and do something. And I don't mean every single day they did, but like they don't come every single day to school either. I mean, you've got kids at any given time who are out sick. Um, so we were really pleased with that. As we moved into the full-time virtual learning, it, that was a bit of a challenge. And I think we, we think that one of the reasons that was harder was because we didn't have the relationships with the teacher to begin with. So if you think about going into the pandemic, you had teachers who knew their kids and kids who knew their classmates and they felt connected, right? So to me, I think one of the lessons that we've learned as we talk about how to make a, our virtual school more impactful is focusing on ways to connect them as a community. But, and the reason I'm kind of going back to this is that I think agency and community and relationships go together. So you yeah. think of agency as being a self-motivated independent thing, but I think that people feel more agency when they feel connected to a community. And so for us, it was, so think about in your own family, right? So as a mom, when you've got young children, you're trying to teach them to take care of their bedroom and take care of their teeth and to help with the dog because they're part of the family, not just because they're their own poor, right? Yeah. So you want, you want them to feel a part of something. And I think that the two are not um, antithetical. I think they are very they're, they go together, agency and community. And so one of the things I think that I would recommend is looking at the ways that you can build the empowerment of your teachers because your teachers have to feel empowered as learners themselves, that they have trust. You, you trust them before they're going to let go and trust children. And I would say that that was the, that's, that's hard, but it's important. And so our superintendent is always about culture and community and that, you know, we, we may not be the most competitive pay, but we want the best culture. And when you've got teachers that feel a part of a school, part of a grade level, part of a team, part of a community, then, and then you show that you trust them to make decisions with teachers. We don't, we have pacing guides that are kind of like what was said earlier, where you've got units of, like these are the standards to teach in this time. We are working to write our own curriculum with differentiation in there for our virtual academy that teachers could use if they choose. But we don't ever want to say, this is the Bible that you're teaching day one, day two, day three, because we feel that that takes away from the teacher's empowerment. And so when teachers are feel empowered and trusted, I think that they in turn have a much easier time letting kids become empowered and trusted and that you have to model what you want them to do. And so that would be my number one thing is treat your teachers like you want them to treat their your the kids, which is empowering them and trusting them. Um, and then making it a safe place to fail for your adults so that they can do that safe place to fail for kids. Um, and I can't, I don't think I can overstate the importance of what I just said about the culture of community is what builds agency in children and that that has to be worked on because kids will want to do well to please people they care about. And so yeah, that has to be a part of your culture. Yeah. It's such an interesting statement. And I, and, and I, some philosopher I read back in the day, he's said something like, you know, you're, 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 almost never driven by self-interest people humans are more driven by helping others than anything else and it's a very interesting viewpoint because you know there's a few people on planet earth that are just mean and they're not but you know but i think that's really true most people aren't and so that that um propensity to please uh 
not being tapped into is kind of the downfall of agency, right? So if you've just said, here's what you got to do, you're constantly authoritarian, Mm -hmm. which, which like admittedly, Barbara, that's the position the most schools for the last hundred years. Right. Hell, don't ask. Um, Direct attention, you know, lecture. Uh, Here's a test. Go read this. Come back. You know, um, the loss of agency. Overnight, the pandemic came in and now everybody has to have agency. Like all like every business in America, too. Like all my staff are working from home. So you, you really have a situation right. where there has, this is a cataclysmic shift in a demand for individuals to be personally responsible for themselves and contribute to a community that isn't even physically there and, be, it, and sense that they are part of that. And, and, and I, I don't think we can underestimate what a deep well of change that is for people. And so you- It's you, true. It's yeah. so true. Like even, even, and I'll, I will admit like for as much as we have really been trying to work toward this, I struggled as a supervisor at the very beginning with, we're not coming in like at all for a while, like, you know, and like, but now like, I feel like there's this greater level of trust. There's a greater level of collegiality and cooperation and that we have each other's backs and I, I think that that flexibility gets appreciated and people choose to come in more than they choose not to. But I think it's nice to have adults like choice and so do kids. I, I do want to say, too, that having raised three sons. So one of mine, I've got my Medical University College of Pharmacy sh- um, shirt on for my son today. He's a med student in pharmacy at, at um, the Medical University of South Carolina. Children aren't adults. And so I think it's really important that we understand that what what agency looks like for a first grader or fourth grader or seventh Mm -hmm. grader and eighth grader is different and that all kids develop agency and grow in that in different ways. And that what always it has to come back to when you feel that the kids are not being responsible is it's got to go back to the relationship piece and not the authoritarian. And when it's when kids are in a classroom, you feel like you can control them, but just because you're controlling their physical behavior does not mean that you're creating agency and that they feel empowered as learners. So learning how to try to help kids, you know, want to learn and helping them see what are the, like of all the things that, that I've asked you to do, let's, can we pick the three that you really think you can get done today? I, like sometimes you just have to have those kinds of conversations and, and just realize that this in the history of kids, they've never been asked to do what we've asked them to do. Like this is hard for them, right? It's like, this is not an easy thing for them either. So, yeah. you know, let's give the kids some credit and a shout out for all that they have, that they have gone through because no one has ever asked them to do this now. And I will say we've stuck with, we've, we've stuck with our kind of finished Friday stuff, even when we're doing WebEx, like, okay, we're going to take a 15 minute break. So you can close your Chromebook or play with your cat or walk your dog or run around the, go run around the house for a few minutes, get out and get some air, you know, go to the bathroom, get a drink, whatever you need to do so that kids feel a little bit of choice and power too in their schedule, even when you're doing some synchronous learning. So um, but it's been it's been a huge challenge. Yeah, and I I, I really think that that um, we're doing some soul searching now, school districts mm-hmm. nationwide, about how we how we are and how we be, um, mm-hmm. and that delicate balance between authoritarian telling you what to do, being slowly lifted as the child gets older. I don't hear a lot of people really talking about that. But now you kind of have to, because right out of the gate, you're now going to have to demand a little bit more agency forever. The second thing I really want to talk about is I know you're, you're working on, you know, building your own online entity and courses and courseware. And I I have some ideas for you. I'm going to give you behind the scenes on that. Um, But in terms of logistics, one of the things you said sort of, you know, is really real for me. And that is, you know, you want to give the pacing guide. Right. So here's the standards floating out there. And then like 
districts grab them and like corral them onto the calendar, kachunk, kachunk, right? And then here you go, teacher. You, you got some guidance in terms of when, mm -hmm. but the how, here's my problem with the how, um, Barbara, is yes, we want a teacher to feel their own sense of agency of how they teach something. But when you allow every sixth grade teacher to teach what their set of standards is differently, your analytics are gonna be a mess, mishmash of weirdness. How are we doing across the district? We don't really know because these people all teach it differently. And when the age of textbooks was there, it was more authoritarian, but it had the flexibility in each chapter, right? Like, you know, some teachers would even skip some chapters and they would show a video, you know, from the Discovery Channel or whatever. I remember, you know, when I was young, TVs getting rolled in and out, you know, stuff. I had one teacher who used to teach with Snoopy cartoons and it was really significant. Anyway, um, so what I'm looking at is, is like, I think there's a little bit deeper level to this, like what Engage to Learn was talking about early in the day is that the scaffolding of the standards and the laying of the main path mm -hmm. is incumbent upon the districts because teachers are always going to manifest creativity, but I think we've almost given them too much. It's like, mm -hmm. here's your stuff, plot it on the calendar. Now you go, okay, when I was 3.3 million teachers all across the nation, getting creative. I mean, what is the workload on our country? I mean, like, whoa, mm -hmm. right. You see what I'm saying? So I, 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 I and I also mm -hmm. think we can't get to really comprehensively using our teachers for that absolutely necessary right now, human quality. If they're messing around with uh, find, build, uh, sequence, orchestrate, execute, run all the traffic, they're, they're not going to pay, pay attention to the kids. They don't have time. They don't really have right. time. If they're still whole grouping their way to glory, they're not going to personalize because it's totally- You can't. It's anachronistic. Yeah. You, personalization, right. whole group, those don't go together. Um, so what are your thoughts on what I'm saying? Because I'm really spending a lot of time working on logistics. Like, what does this look like? What are algorithms going to do? And how is this really going to work? I, I think there's several strategies that, that we've put in place and are continuing to put in place. One is like, we, we're kind of lucky because we've been, I won't say lucky, but maybe we're reaping the rewards of just all the work of having teachers who've been building digital curriculum. So we've been able to test it and try it. So we've got like a repertoire where you've got this unit that's well designed that you've got teachers that we know have gotten good results and we can put those into a repository and share them, right? Yeah. And so then if you you kind of have some vetted approved curriculum is that may not have been written by the district, but is still very good vetted. And so it's easy for if you're teaching, you know, molecular energy for this three week window and you can look at three different ways that different teachers have successfully taught it. And you can say, oh, I, I can see all of that. And then, well, this would, this unit would, this would be good for this group of kids who are really interested in this topic. I think it helps to have that. Yeah. It is messy in the process of building it. And then some of the teachers who have the best units, you have to encourage them to share because they don't think they're ever good enough. And some teachers who sometimes are most willing to share aren't the teachers whose stuff you want. So you have to be really careful. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that um, analytics getting applied to some of that over the next several years is going to cause that cream to rise to the top of the milk, so to speak. And then pretty soon districts and people in positions like yours are going to go, you know what, we're going to use this one. This is the one. And uh, let's not fight about it anymore. Let's just do this. I also think that this whole idea of uh, the, what's called the extra liminal network of expertise is going to come into play within the next couple of years. So let's say, uh, Barbara, you've got like the world-class physics teacher who like dresses up as a molecule and blah, 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 does stuff. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the electric universe teaches something, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like a, a videos, parts of the lesson, codifies the whole lesson sequences and stuff. And pretty soon you've got other teachers who are like, can I just like use your stuff? Like, why am I redoing, why am I reinventing the light bulb? I just can use your stuff. And pretty soon that then becomes the aspect of the human teaching, coaching, eyeballing kids and unraveling why they don't understand something is the mm -hmm. real teaching. And the rest is just content. Um, I know you're onto this because you're using Safari Montage. 
Right, right, right. So what are you? And your- our state, our state actually bought Safari Montage for the whole state. Oh wow! I didn't and know. so Lee DeAndrea, do you know Dr. DeAndrea? Mm-mm. Oh, she's amazing. Um, but she's a retired superintendent. She was superintendent in Pickens County and Anderson four, but she's doing some work with the state, but they're actually working to develop units of instruction, high quality units of instruction that can be shared out. So I think giving teachers some choice in, and I agree with you, I, uh, that, that, that having, having like saying, here are some model lessons, right? Here's some model ways that you can teach this that were proven to be effective. Yeah. And then giving teachers some choice to go in and say, you know, I can take this, but I get, there are some ways that I can tweak it because I have these kids interest in my classroom and I want to modify this, but then I want to turn around and share that. So everybody else will be able to do that. That again, comes about through the collegial relationships that you build. And so when we have our folks in instructional service, working with the chemistry teachers, the third grade science teachers, they're looking at how they can pull these resources together and make them available to to teachers, um, because you're right. Like, why would we have teachers? And it's not, I, I don't want to, you to think I'm for a packaged content and curriculum necessarily, but I think having a menu of things that are already built so the teachers spend less time building and more time relating to their kids and learning their kids and helping their kids with that I'm mastering and being able to customize it if, in ways that are easy for them to do. I do think all of that matters for their time and effectiveness in the classroom. Yeah, and I and I and I know uh, uh, my ideal scene would be like like let's say we're kids again, Barbara. Wouldn't that be fun? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm in an environment where like I get a normalized path, but then the teacher is looking at me and going, "Man, you really love dinosaurs and unicorns." And um, I want to talk to you about the mythologicalness that you're interested in is, and I'm going to modify what we're doing mm-hmm. this particular thing so that you can be more interested um, or, or get more out of it or whatever. And I feel like the unlimited universe of stuff out there that we've been looking at. I mean, if you're familiar at all with how much is in Safari Montage alone, you get an idea. I mean, there's tens of thousands, millions of stuffs out there. Right. Overwhelming. So, and the and the ever expanding level of human knowledge is just is going it, to it's going to be exceptional. So so really, um, mm-hmm. taking something that's normalized and then allow that teacher to really um, be the specialist counselor to that individual child. Be like, listen, I'm going to slow you down on this stuff right here because you missed this other stuff back here, and I'm going to back you up and customize on the normalized path, something that's a side eddy, like a separate driveway path. And then you're going to come back to the main highway later. But we're doing this because once you get that, then poof, your mind will be like, whoa. And now you're going to be into a, into science or physics or whatever, but you miss something. So I really feel like teachers mm-hmm. are like the mechanics who have to really get kids through things. I mean, that's what we're expecting, right? Like achievement mm-hmm. level, blah, blah, blah. And they're, in this particular conversion moment, they're way too much into the content. And it's like, no, stop that. Pay attention. Kids are, kids are committing suicide out there. This is a right. serious moment. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And I think, I think it's the more that we can do to make their job easier so that they can focus on the important is what we need to be doing as, as leaders at the district office level. Yeah. Yeah. And it's highly complex. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we just step back and go <laughs> and go, mm-hmm. here's ed K-12 education and mm-hmm. you know, IMS global, you know, there's 7,000 mm-hmm. vendors in the field. There's tens of millions of digital learning objects. There's the student information system, the LMS, the financial system, the HR, blah, 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 blah. It's this big ball of blah and integrations. And then you shove that at a teacher and be like, have at it. And they're go over in here and Pinterest right? This is what That's they true. They're, you're and, right. And, and and then they're trying to figure themselves out and everything's, and, and we're pelting them with standards, this and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And now, and now, by the way, we're going to be off on Thursday. Oh, next week we're going to cancel because there's another variant of COVID. And then we're going to come back and now you're going to have summer stuff. And this is going to be like this. I mean, in comparison mm-hmm. to any other industry, this is an insane field. I mean, it's, it it's, is, it I is. Mean, you're professional and a lot of the people that we have in uh, on our events are total professionals, but I, I'm surprised everybody's in crazy right now. I really am. And it, it is amazing that teachers are surviving as well as they are. 
Um, yeah, and, but I, and I don't know, like I, I have a, you know, a dipstick on Pickens County. I don't know how some teachers are doing in other places. I don't know that they're doing well everywhere. I really don't. They're not. I've had superintendents tell me they've got teachers in their office crying or crying over Zoom meetings. I mean, yeah, there, there's a breakdown. Yeah, I think there I think there is. We've been fortunate because we've been able to be um, face to face and for the ones who really wanted to be face to face. Like a lot of our teachers who are in the virtual are some of the teachers who chose to do that because they had concerns about either their family or their own health. So it was it was good for them as well. But I do think. I, the collective grief in our community is, is it, and I think our community, I mean, we have 3.6% unemployment, right, Lonnie? One of the lowest in the country. We still have this collective grief going on because everybody, like, it's like, I couldn't name one person who's died of the flu in the last 10 years. I can name you a dozen people I know who've died of COVID. And so. Yeah, my stepmom died of COVID. I'm sorry. Yeah. So yes. And this is, this is this collective grief that our, that's our burden to bear right now, that it's hard. Children have lost grandparents. They've not, and some of these kids are the ones in virtual school and they've not been able to come to school to even get away from the, the layer of grief that their mom or their dad has in the home. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to take time for all of us to heal from grief. It takes yeah. time. We know this. Yeah. We and I think take joy. attention to that. Yeah. And we have to look for joy wherever we can. <clears throat> Cause you know, even in our family, the, the funeral had to be, this Northern Minnesota, right. Where my dad and stepmom lived in super cold outside, no services allowed had to be outside at the graveyard, super cold. Right. This is weird. This is a weird moment for everyone. So we need to look for the joy right? Mm -hmm. There is a huge amount of joy in the fact that we have kids learning at all. I'm amen. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we have to keep remembering, remind every teacher that every week learning is occurring, even if it's not as yes. much as we want or as frequently as we want, or, and there were lots of achievement. Some kids have opted out and they're going to private schools or online schools or whatever. There's something happening 20 years ago. There's no way you could have afforded this many devices. There's no way you could have got internet to even half those kids. And the fact that you've gotten mm -hmm. this far at all is a miracle. We are so mm -hmm. far ahead of other nations. It's ridiculous. There is so much joy in that. There's so much joy in just seeing someone else's face. Right. You know? I mean, and just that we can do bad. this, right? We have yeah. technology, even as like, well, I know we're all zoomed out or whatever, but this is better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And you I know? think there's a certain joy in the scene in other people's homes too. And be like, Hey, do you ever clean yeah. home? Like what's going on? Oh, is that your cat? You know, how cute. Yeah. It, and uh, yeah. that's made me feel closer to so many people. Yeah. Like I'm in your home with you. You know, it's like, how cool is that? You know, like, well, that I, and our been parents, they've before. been so gracious and so appreciative of just the things that, that we've been able to provide as much face-to-face -face instruction that we have brought food to them that we've, you know, we've been trying to get, do what we can with internet. Like there's a level, I think of support in our community. This has not torn our community apart. Like we're hurting, yeah. but I feel like we're hurting together. Yeah. And um, it's a good, and, and, and we're, I don't know. It just feels different. I don't know how to say, and I don't know how long it'll go on, but I, I just feels there's a positive synergy in our County that we've, we can do this. This is really hard. It's been hard, but we've got this and we're going to stay together and this is not going to break us. And I know that's not how it is everywhere, but, I, but I really feel that here. And I think this, I mean, I think the schools played a small part in that, you know, that cohesiveness. Yeah, um, you know, you created yeah. a community. Yeah. And that's awesome. And so it's like every day we have to look for those blessings. Like, you know, the fact that we have anything going on at all. And we're talking today. I mean, wow. Holy cow, this is awesome. Yeah. And so there's awesomeness in everything. Some of those really shy kids that never raised their hand in class before are mm -hmm. the little chatty Cathy's now. Blah, 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 blah. You know, they're like, they're totally into it. One of my employees just said their, their son is flourishing in this environment, which is amazing, right? Like not everybody is, like some kids are, are not. Let me tell you a quick, a cool story. We had, um, we had some chickens hatching in March. 
And so when all this happened, just thankfully we had WebEx and the tools and all to do this. And so thankfully, thankfully those chicks hatched during the school day. And so the kids were able to watch them hatch. Oh. And so like, and you know that they were just like second graders and that sounds like such a little thing, but like they were so, just to see the, the video, we watched the video the teacher shared with us of the kids. And it was like, they were gathered around these chickens while they were hatching in, in, in our WebEx. And so, you know, you, you are, you're thankful for the little things that you get. Um, it's not easy. I mean, we've, we've overcome a lot and we've got, a, we've got a lot to still overcome. Um, but you know, I, I, I think we're on a journey and I think that this has, sh has um, shown the light on what things we need to do. And I think what you said about some cohesiveness around providing our teachers high quality digital curriculum that matches the pacing guide that has some choice built into it. So teachers can pick and choose instead of always creating. Yeah, that's the scary thing I'm it's witnessing and why I'm on this you know, constant march of events across the country, even though we're doing them virtually right now, is because, you know, 50% more of the districts joined the fray. You were already in it. Mm -hmm. But 50% more, like we're in a forced march, right? Like, like they got on the board and passed out devices and they've got every teacher trying to Google around and build everything in Google or not even in an LMS, right? Like, so it's That's insanity. Hard. And I mean, I, you know, Google's great, but I challenge anybody to figure out my filing methodology, you know, and uh, not have overly nested kids get, you know, files where kids are lost in the ether and can't find stuff. And, and it's ridiculous. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I, I, you know, I think we have to go back to saying, okay, long way to go. Still having some positives in all this. The fact that we, the fact that uh, any learning at all is occurring is huge. And, um, you know, I'm proud of what you're doing. Can you pass that along to all the others there? I will. Actually, I, I, council's raw rawing you on. It's super awesome. Yeah, I'll be glad to share anything. I'll share this on um, the slide deck. And then if you want to reach out any of my contacts, I'll put you in touch with. But, um, yeah, we're glad to share. Okay. Um, you know, we feel very blessed here. And we've got like, don't like, you know, we've got our issues. We, everybody does. Um, but it's yeah. always good to share and it, we'll be glad to learn from others. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Everyone that's on the line right now. Thank you for being with us. If you have a last minute question, I'm going to stay on the line for one more minute. And um, let me see if I'm sharing my screen. I want to thank all of our sponsors. So type in whatever last minute questions you have. Um, our sponsors were so awesome to share with us. Engage to learn what awesome work they're doing. Lightspeed. If it wasn't for them, I don't think anybody would be able to go back to school for real. Um, Trafera doing awesome work, um, mm -hmm. Walsh curriculum engine, really great new math program, Rando with the teacher wallet, Scholastics, Scholastics doing great stuff, Classlink, and No Story. So thanks everyone for being with us. Thanks, uh, Barbara, for being our friend and for uh -huh. sharing and being willing because once, just so you know, once these things, once these videos go live online, there's like a, a ton of people who are watching them at their leisure when they're not during the school day. So it's like, a, it's a huge audience. And um, you, it, it, we're really grateful that you share. So. My pleasure.